In this video, we will provide an overview of our evaluation model, in this case using Google as a case example that we are going to build. We're going to talk about how we start with our base model and create a forecast of 11 years of financial statements, which will give us 11 years of economic statements, which will eventually give us our enterprise discounted cash flow and economic profit valuation. So I want to start with just an overview of the model. The model is a series of tabs which move from left to right. The first three tabs, data tabs, IS, BS, and CF, are basically the standardized exported income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow data that come from Bloomberg Professional. This model is based on Bloomberg Pro as a standardized data source, which allows us to create a reusable model so that if we export further data from Bloomberg, then we can reuse it in this model to value different companies. This is not really set up to value banks or financial services. It's more for traditional manufacturing and service companies. In this case, we're going to use, again, Google as a working example. So we had previously, in a different video, talked about how to get data out of Bloomberg. This is the exported data for the standardized Google uh, under FA, the income statement. This tab is the balance sheet. This tab is the statement of cash flow. What we then do is to come here to the income tab and we recreate the income statement primarily for two reasons. One, we want to make sure that the data that we have foots because obviously if it doesn't foot, it's going to cause problem with our valuation and economic conversion. And two, we're going to actually use this not only to look at the historical data, but also to create the forecasted financial statements. In this case, the income statement on the balance sheet tab. Well, this is the historical balance sheet, which again we'll use to create the forecast for the forecasted balance sheets. There's a change in equity tab, which helps us with our CFI, getting it to balance. And then these are our economic statements. Statements of TFI, total funds available to investors. TII, total income available to investors. And CFI, cash flow available to investors. These Statements, again, are mapped to the income and balance tab so that they are automatically converted. And more importantly, when we forecast the income statements and balance sheets, we can copy these forward and it will give us forecasted economic statements. I also included a tab called EPBOY and EOY. BOY stands for beginning of year so that when we forecast an economic profit based on beginning of year invested capital for ROYC and economic profit, we'll actually get our DCF <clears throat> and economic profit valuations to balance. But for analytics, we might also choose to year, use end of year data, which is the EPEOY tab, which is based on end of year invested capital for ROYC and economic profit. And then finally, <clears throat> there is the ROYC tree, which is in the ROYC drivers tab. So based on end of year data, which again gives us a breakdown and analysis of historical ROYC. So let's start the process of forecasting. In this case, we're going to forecast 11 years worth of income statements and balance sheets. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to forecast using the ratios tab. So again, this is going to be a critical tab in our model. These are historical ratios, income statement and balance sheet, all based primarily on a percentage of revenue, with the exception of revenue growth rate. And this will give us both historical analysis and will help us with our future forecast. I also created a tab called Assumptions, which has miscellaneous assumptions that we'll use in our model. You'll notice that I've introduced the color yellow, and yellow means that we can make changes to those fields in the future, where if fields are not yellow, that means we should not make changes and we should leave those fields alone. As the model gets more complex, we want to minimize the areas of where we put the assumptions, so they're all in as few a place as possible, so that when we reuse the model, we don't have to worry about data being scattered all over that we have to change. So again, all of the changes that we're going to make are going to be confined to the two tabs, the general assumptions tab and the ratios tab. And again, the highlight of color helps us understand which fields that we can change versus which ones we should leave alone. All right, so let's start out forecasting the financial ratios. In this case, we're going to forecast again 11 years, the first 10 years being what's called the defined period. And we always need a T plus one year, which in this case will be the 11th year for our continuing value period. Again, we're just choosing an arbitrary 11-year forecasting range for this model. 
So in this case, again, I want to use relative references where possible. My first forecast year equals the previous year plus one. So in this case, it would be 2013 for Google. And the first item that we're going to forecast <clears throat> is the revenue growth rate. And so as a starting point in our model, we're just going to assume that the ratios stay the same. Now we'll change those later, but we'll start out by saying equals the previous revenue growth rate. I'm also going to make that a yellow cell because that is something that I will choose to change at a later date. Next, for cost of revenue, also known as cost of goods sold or cost of sales, again equals the previous year. We'll once again make this one yellow as something we're going to change, which means that we've essentially forecasted our gross profit, also known as gross margin, because revenue minus cost of revenue equals gross profit, and we have to make a determination. We either forecast gross profit directly, or we forecast, in this case, the component of gross profit, cost of revenue, to get our gross profit. So in this case, gross profit equals one minus the cost of revenue. Next, we'll forecast operating expenses, also known as SG&A, equals the previous year. Again, I'm gonna make that yellow <clears throat> because that is something that I will change later, which gets me a forecast for EBITDA. So EBITDA equals my gross profit, in this case, minus my operating expenses, and that is my forecast for EBITDA. Next, I'm going to forecast my depreciation amortization, non-cash expenses. Again, make that yellow. And if I take my EBITDA minus my DA, that gets me my operating income, also as operating profit, and again, a lot of times it's referred to as EBIT, earnings before interest and tax. Next, I'm going to forecast my tax rate. And as a starting assumption, what I'm going to do is I need a representative tax rate going forward. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take an average of the previous six years. So this will give me an average tax rate, which hopefully will be representative for most companies. Now, again, if for some reason a company's average tax rate over the last six years does not turn out to be reasonable because they had major losses or other issues with taxes, then we might choose to choose a different way of forecasting a reasonable tax rate. But in this case for Google, I would assume that this average tax rate does look reasonable for the forecast period. Next, we'll forecast our no plat by taking our operating profit or operating income and multiplying that by one minus the tax rate. And finally, net operating gains and losses equals the previous year. And again, that is something we could change, so I will make it yellow. All right, so that has created the basic forecast for the income statement. And now what I'm going to do is, based on these ratios, start creating the income statement. So I'm going to go to the income tab and to demarcate the historical and forecast data, I'm going to label this forecast so I can, when I print this out, realize that 2013 in this case would be my first forecasted year. Relative reference equals previous year plus one. And now I'm going to start creating my forecast. So for revenue, <clears throat> I have a revenue growth rate on my ratios tab. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 2012 revenue. I'm going to multiply it by left paren one plus from my ratios, the revenue growth rate. 2013, right print. And I'm going to take this entire column and I'm going to format this as currency to one decimal place to match the other formats. So the assumption is that if Google were to grow 32.4%, which was its growth rate in 2012, then in 2013 that would lead to 66,416.8. Now eventually what we're going to do is we're going to use this as sort of a starting assumption and we'll refine the revenue growth rate later. But for example, let's say Google were only to grow at 15%. Then if I change this to 15 on the income tab, you'll notice that that revenue now represents a 15% revenue growth rate. I'm going to undo that because right now I'm going to start out with the baseline assumptions. Where everything is just equal. And later, once we've built the model, we'll then refine assumptions to get more realistic ratios in there, which will give us hopefully a better valuation of the company. All right, so I forecasted revenue. Next, I need to forecast cost of revenue. 
So in this case, cost of revenue equals, from my ratios tab, cost of revenue as a percentage of sales for 2013 times, from my income tab, 2013 forecasted revenue. My gross profit equals my revenue minus my cost of revenue. Next, operating expenses equals, from my ratios, operating expenses as a percentage of revenue times, from my income tab, 2013 forecasted revenue. EBITDA equals gross profit minus operating expenses. Depreciation amortization equals ratios. DNA is a percentage of sales in 2013 times income tab 2013 revenue. Operating income equals EBITDA minus the DA, and that gets me my operating profit, which is going to be the most, or operating income, most important part of my forecast because that's going to drive no plat. Now, for the next few items, <coughs> we're going to have to make some assumptions here. Based on an enterprise DCF, companies are generally targeting a constant capital structure over their valuation horizon. It's one of the assumptions we make with enterprise DCF. For simplicity, we're going to interpret that to mean that right now we're not going to forecast changes in the debt. We're going to leave the debt alone, which means we're going to leave the interest expense alone. So for now, whatever interest expense they have, they're going to continue, equal the previous year. For foreign exchange gains and losses, we can either choose to leave those as zero, or we can look at the trend they've had previously. In this case, I'm going to choose to have it equal the previous year. As a starting assumption, again, we can change any of these assumptions later if we need to, to be more representative. <clears throat> and then finally, my non-operating gains and losses equals from the ratios tab. We have that as a forecast percentage times from the income tab revenue, 2013 forecast. Therefore, my pre-tax income equals my operating income minus those three items. Minus that, minus that, minus that. And again, just matching the format over here on the left-hand side of the screen. Next, for income tax expense, I'm gonna take my pre-tax income and I'm gonna multiply it by my ratios, my forecasted tax rate. And that's gonna get me income before extraordinary items. Right. Extraordinary losses, those should not occur in the future because by definition they're extraordinary, so we're going to assume they're zero. One-time items shouldn't happen in the future. Not saying they wouldn't, but we're just going to assume that they don't. Minority interest, again, whatever minority interest they're paying, we're going to assume they keep paying since we're going to leave all of their capital structure items constant for our forecast as an initial assumption, and therefore that would get us net income. So equals income before extraordinary items minus those two items. Next, whatever cash preferred dividends, they're going to keep paying. Any other adjustments, which are generally accounting adjustments to the financial statement after tax, again, we're going to assume that they are zero in the future, and that will get us net income available to common shareholders, equals net income minus those two items. Again, if it makes you feel better and you want to forecast those individually, if I think those are relevant, you can feel free to do so uh, in your version of the model. But again, you'll quickly find it doesn't have anything to do with the future valuation of the company. Abnormal gains and losses. Again, the word is abnormal, which means they shouldn't occur in the future, even though they seem to be happening for the last five years. So therefore, we're going to assume that they are zero. Normalized income equals net income plus the abnormal gains and losses. And finally, whatever dividends the company's paying, we'll assume they keep paying. And again, I'm going to take equals normalized income plus the dividends paid. And the reason I'm adding the dividends paid, even though it's a minus there on the left, is because when the data comes in from Bloomberg, dividends are actually treated as a negative number on Bloomberg's statement of cash flow. So I'm going to be adding a negative number which is the same thing as subtracting. And that will get me my forecasted change in retained earnings. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to go back to my ratios tab and assuming that the 2013 income statement continued to 2023, 
as similar ratios, I'm just going to copy and paste those out for the 11 years. Then I'm going to go to my income tab and I'm going to take the 2013 numbers, copy it, and paste this out 11 years to 2023. Now again, I just highlight the rows, make it a little bit wider so all the data fits. These numbers are getting pretty big. But what I've just created is a forecast for 11 years worth of income statements. Now, obviously, if Google kept growing at 35% a year, they'd end up being the first trillion dollar company in revenue. That's probably unrealistic and something which we will eventually adjust for. But again, right now we're just setting up the model. So we're just gonna assume that the 2012 assumptions continue. Again, we will change those assumptions later. All right, so now that we've finished <coughs> forecasting the income statement, we're going to move on to the forecast of the balance sheet. Again, we're going to start by ratios. And in this case, I've chosen these nine ratios to directly forecast. Again, if you wanted to add more or less ratios, you can choose to do so. But for our purposes, we're going to start with these ratios. Again, equals the previous year. We're going to make this yellow copy and paste this down. Now these ratios are all driven as a percentage of sales. <clears throat> Ideally you want the ratio to be driven by the economic driver on the income statement on the balance sheet. So for example, inventories are generally forecasted based on cost of goods sold, not based on changes in revenue. However, in practice this doesn't make too much of a difference and ultimately for simplicity we're setting up our model so that the entire balance sheet is driven by changes in revenue. So the idea is, as a company adds revenue, how much more balance sheet would they have to add in order to, to meet that revenue target? So essentially what we're forecasting here is an assumption of productivity. If we leave the productivity constant, then over time as the company grows, so will the balance sheet, and that will create the concept of gross investment. We can choose to individually forecast items later, but these are the ratios that we're going to start with. So based on these ratios, we're going to start creating our balance sheet. So in this case, I'm going to go to the balance tab and again, highlight my forecast period equals previous year plus one. And we'll start out with the forecast. The first one is operating cash. Now, this is the one item that's not on the ratios tab. I actually have this on the assumptions tab. And this is operating cash as a percentage of revenue. Assumptions B3. And I want to multiply that by, from the income tab, the 2013 forecasted revenue. And again, I'm going to take this column, format it as currency, one decimal place. So, <clears throat> assuming that operating cash is 2% of revenue, which represents about one week of sales, then 2% of forecasted revenue would be the 1328.3. Now, when I copy this forward, <clears throat> unlike the rest of the ratios, this assumption is only one cell for operating revenue for the business. Again, operating revenue represents cash that can't be paid out, that needs to be held in the business as part of essentially working capital to run the business day to day. So, in this case, what I need to do is I need to make this, since it's only one cell for forecasting operating revenue, I need to, on my balance sheet, make this an absolute reference which means I put a dollar sign or what's called a string in front of the B and a dollar sign or string in front of the three. What that tells Excel is that when I copy and paste, always refer to cell B3 on the assumptions tab. If you don't put the dollar sign in front of the B and the three, then as you copy forward, it would be B3, C3, D3, E3, etc. By putting the dollar sign in front of the B and the dollar sign in front of the three, as you copy and paste, it will always refer back to that same cell. All right, <clears throat> next. We're going to forecast accounts receivable going back down the ratios. So 15.7% in 2013 times from the income tab 2013 revenue. Inventory equals ratios inventory times income tab 2013 revenue. Other current assets equals ratios, other current assets, times, income, 2013 revenue. 
long-term investments equals from the income tab go the other way 2013 revenue times ratios long-term investments as a percentage of revenue next one's net fixed assets equals ratios net fixed assets times income 2013 revenue next other long-term assets equals ratios other long-term assets times income 2013 revenue next ratio is accounts payable <clears throat> equals ratios accounts payable as a percentage of revenue times income 2013 revenue next we have other short-term liabilities equals income sorry equals ratios other short-term liabilities times income 2013 revenue and finally we have other long-term liabilities equals ratios other long-term liabilities times income 2013 forecasted revenue okay these are the nine items that we have forecasted obviously if we wanted to forecast other items we could put them in the ratios but I think these are the key ones to forecast in this case to finish up the balance sheet which we must balance we're gonna start out by finishing up the liabilities and equity side so we're gonna finish the balance sheet and make sure we don't have a circular reference in our model which would mean we have a flawed model so I'm gonna show you how to do it so in this case we're gonna start out by forecasting out equity now for some reason Bloomberg calls this common equity I'm going to change this title to total equity I'm using the Bloomberg titles over here because <clears throat> it's really going to sum up these four items all right so again preferred stock we're going to make an assumption in our model that whatever equity preferred equity the company has it doesn't change in our forecast period so it equals the previous year same thing with minority interest same thing with share capital and APIC is additional paid in capital so again we're not going to directly forecast stock issues or buybacks we'll do that indirectly and I'll talk to you about that in just a minute but minority interest and preferred equity all stay the same as previous year the one item that will change is retained earnings so retained earnings for the current year will be the previous year's retained earnings plus from the income tab the 2013 change in retained earnings so again profit minus dividends since Google is not paying dividends then it's basically their profit <clears throat> is how much the retained earnings will go up by so my total equity will then be the sum of those four items and that would be my forecast for equity for the next year next for short-term borrowings whatever debt they have we're going to assume stays outstanding we're not going to change so equals the previous year therefore my total current liabilities are the sum of those three items long-term borrowing same thing whatever debt they have we're going to assume stays constant pension liabilities equal the previous year so therefore our long-term liabilities are going to be the sum of these three items the once again the sum of long-term borrowings other long-term liabilities and pension liabilities don't want to add in the current liabilities and my total liabilities equal my current plus my long-term and my total liabilities and equity equals my total liabilities plus total equity so that would be my forecast for liabilities and equity now balance sheet must balance so here's how we're going to do it we're going to force the balance sheet to balance by setting total assets equal to total liabilities and equity that means that in order to get our balance sheet to balance we're going to have to put what's called a plug in our model our plug is going to be excess cash so in this case what we need to do is finish up the balance sheet items and then plug for excess cash the balance sheet items that are left that aren't sums are gross assets and gross fixed assets and accumulated depreciation now here's the deal we've already forecasted net fixed assets which means we don't really need to forecast the gross and the accumulated because the net of those are the net fixed assets 
and those don't really matter to our model. What matters is the net fixed assets. So I'm not even going to create a forecast for gross and accumulate depreciation. I'm just going to forecast net fixed assets. Now remember, we are forecasting depreciation on the income statement, so that is forecasting the non-cash item that has tax affected, but we don't really care about the accumulated for purposes of our model. Now again, if you want to make the model more elegant and individually forecast and create the forecast for net fixed assets, you can do so, but I'm just letting you know that that's not really going to have a big impact on our model. The other item that needs to be forecast is, is goodwill. Now, we can do this a couple of different ways, and this is the way that we're going to assume in our model. The most recent academic study that I just read that came out in the McKinsey Quarterly basically said that the average acquisition still is NPV negative, which means that <clears throat> it's hard to forecast acquisitions, and at best, companies don't really create a lot of value through acquisitions. And so therefore, what we'll do is we're just not going to forecast acquisitions because it they're probably not going to create value. Companies are going to pay premiums that make them close to NPV zero. And as I said, the average acquisition is, because of premiums, slightly negative on the NPV side. So the assumption here is that we're just going to say equals the previous year's goodwill as the forecast goodwill. And we're not going to forecast acquisitions. Now, if you are dealing with an acquisitive company, and Google is one, you could choose to forecast goodwill and forecast essentially acquisition premiums by making goodwill a ratio and then making it as a percentage of sales. In this case, we're not going to because I don't think it's really necessary to the valuation, but you could do it if you wanted to look at that as a forecast item for a company. All right, but again, as a starting assumption, this is the way we're going to do it. So <clears throat> we forecasted all of the items individually with the exception of the sums, except for excess cash. Excess cash is now our plug. I'm ready to create our plug. So in this case, excess cash equals total assets, minus everything else, minus operating cash, minus accounts receivable, minus inventory, minus other current assets, minus long-term investments, minus net fixed assets, minus goodwill, minus other long-term assets. And that would be the excess cash balance, assuming that our ratios came true. And you'll notice that there's no circular reference. If you do this and you have a circular reference, then you have a flaw in your model. Now, the other thing to think about excess cash is that excess cash is truly the cash that can be paid out. So again, rather than forecasting changes in debt and changes in equity, dividends and or stock repurchase, then in the future, the excess cash balance represents the forecasted ability to pay out dividends and or buy back stock and or pay off the debt. So the way we're really setting up the model is instead of forecasting directly equity and stock buybacks, what we're doing is we're forecasting it by proxy through the excess cash balance. Now, <clears throat> the only other thing is if for some reason the company you forecast has a negative excess cash balance, then you could choose to make the model look a little bit better in the future by adding some debt and or equity to make sure they have positive cash, but that doesn't seem to be Google's problem here. So back to current assets, I can sum the items above. For long-term assets, I can sum from long-term investments all the way down. And note that if I take my long-term plus my current, that that should match exactly the total assets. So again, I have a balancing matching balance sheet. So the final step is I'm gonna take my ratios. I'm going to copy them and paste them forward. I'm gonna go back to my balance sheet. I'm gonna take 2013, I'm gonna copy it. <clears throat> And I'm going to paste it out to 2023. And again, I'm going to adjust my column widths just so I can see all the numbers without errors. And most importantly, I have balancing balance sheets. Now, the one item that I kind of glossed over is back on the ratios tab, when we had forecasted a tax rate, we had forecasted an average tax rate for 2013. And when we copied and pasted it forward, it continued to do an average tax rate for the previous six years. Starting in 2014, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the tax rate equal to 2013. 
and then I'm going to copy and paste that forward. So eventually in our model we'll create one tax rate which represents the representative tax rate of the company on an ongoing basis and that will be the tax rate that we'll use for the future. Again, <clears throat> we can make some different assumptions but that will be the starting point in our model. Right? So as I said, right now we're assuming the 2012 ratios repeat themselves but you can now see that we can quickly do a what if. So for example, if cost of revenue went to 30%, then I could go to the income statement, I could see what the changes would immediately be. All right? That's eventually what we're going to do. Right now, I'm going to undo that change, so don't make that change your model yet. And we can quickly see that we have set up the baseline model here. So our final steps are to go to the economic statements and just copy them forward because they're already mapped to these income statements and balance sheets. So I'll start out with a statement of TFI, take 2012, copy and paste it forward to 2023, relative reference for years, visual check that the model still balances, TII, same process, copy and paste through 2023. Again, need to make these cells a little bit bigger because these numbers are getting rather large. And just show the relative years plus one. And copy and paste that forward. And again, making sure that the TI is balanced. And finally, CFI. Again, copy 2012. And paste it forward to 2023. Again, equals previous year plus one. Copy and paste that forward. Notice there is a total column here and a percentage. This is something so that we can do the historical analysis of the historical five years. This is already summing up the historical five years. Just looked as a placeholder in the model. We'll talk about that in a future video. But again, we forecasted out CFIs. Most important, we want to make sure the CFIs balance in our model. Notice that the CFI stays constant in our forecast period. That, given the assumptions we made, should be expected. Since we're not forecasting any change in dividends, change in interest, debt buybacks, equity stock buybacks, or issues, then there's no change in the cash flow available to equity holders. Therefore, or, sorry, cash flow available to investors. Therefore, that's going to be constant. And you'll notice that since the cash the company is earning is not being paid out, it's all being sent to increases in excess cash, which is why the balance sheet is growing. So again, this is just reinforcing why the excess cash balance becomes a proxy for what we can pay out in our model. Finally, go to my economic profit based on beginning of your tab, or beginning of your capital, copy and paste this out. through 2023. Got one extra year here. And EPEOI. Again, copy and paste this equals previous year plus one. Again, through 2023. And again, making sure I have all of these statements balance. So I have my economic profit based on the end of the year, economic profit based on the beginning of the year, CFI, TII, TFI, all my economic statements. I have a forecast for 11 years of balance sheet and income statement created by 11 years of ratios. That will conclude this video, and in a future video, we'll talk about how to add in the valuation tabs to the model and then complete the valuation example case of Google.